Welcome. Hey guys, today we're going to talk about uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and cessationism. Let me tell you exactly what I mean. The big question today is this. Um, does the Bible teach that tongues as a spiritual gift, prophecy, and knowledge as spiritual gifts, that they have ceased after the apostles left the scene and the church received the completed Bible? Does this particular passage we're going to go over today, does it teach that? This is actually the biggest go-to passage in the debate between cessationism and continuationism. And we're going to try to unpack it a bit today in the Tuesday live stream. Welcome. Uh, I'm Pastor Mike Winger. I do this every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, we do theology, apologetics, and talking about the Christian life as well. And I'm hoping that what I do will equip you to think biblically about everything. I don't just want you to, to think of me as an authority who tells you what to think about these passages. Rather, I want to give you some things to think about so you can think about these passages, if, if you know what I mean, um, as well as uh, defense of the Christian faith and all that good stuff. But today's uh, very much theology stuff, not apologetics, as far as we're doing today. If you have any questions, you can put them in the in the uh, live chat if you're watching live, and I'll answer those at the end. Just put a capital Q so that we'll know that your comment is a question, and I'll gather several of those. Can't do all of them, and I'll try to answer them at the end. So first, let's start with some definitions. I say cessationism. What do I mean by that? Well, I looked for a few definitions online pre prepping for this teaching. And um, one that I liked I found from uh, Theopedia, and it's the following uh, definition. I thought this was pretty good, pretty clear. It was pretty clear for me. It says, cessationism in Christian theology is the view that the miraculous gifts of the Spirit, such as healing, tongues, and prophetic revelation, pertaining, uh, pertained to the apostolic era only served a purpose that was unique to establishing the early church and passed away before the canon of scripture was closed. And they give a few verses to, to highlight these points. And one of them is actually the passage we'll be in today. Um, it is contrasted with continuationism. So on one side, you have cessation. The other side, you have continuation. One side, ceasing of the gifts. The other side, continuing of the gifts. So it's contrasted with continuationism, which is the view that the miraculous gifts are normative, have not ceased, and are available for the believer today. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys a what I think is a balanced view, at least my own opinion on this topic, and I'll share for you to consider and think about as you're kind of mulling these things over yourself. Um, but there are these sort of two extreme views, and they're both represented in this definition right here: cessation. These things are done with; they're done, right? Then there's the continuationist. Not only do they happen, but they're supposed to be normative, like it should be happening in every church on a regular basis. This is just how it works. Um, so let's dig in. Um, we'll do the two extreme views. We'll look at the passage in 1 Corinthians 13, which I'm going to bring up right now. And then I'm going to share with you guys what I hope will be some balancing thoughts uh, for you to at least consider. Um, as I don't pretend to have all the answers on this issue, but um, I'll try to stimulate good, good, hopefully biblical thinking on the topic. Okay, so here's the passage. I'm just going to read straight through it. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 13. We're going to read this whole section. Then I'm going to share with you two different cessationist interpretations of 1 Corinthians 13. Then we'll analyze them, uh, and I'll, I'll walk through the passage and do a verse-by-verse -verse treatment. And then I have a lot more to share with you, some little, some little special nuggets of things that you will find interesting and possibly irritating <laughs> towards the end, because I, I don't want this to be a case for rampant... Um, you know, sensationalism. And so I'm going to balance that out a little bit towards the end here. But 1 Corinthians 13, 8, here we go. Love never ends. All right, so we're in the passage about love. We all know the passage. You know the context. 1 Corinthians 13, the love passage, right? So he says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. Here's the analogy. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. Um, I think I need to give you a little more on the screen here. There it is. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Now this in 1 Corinthians, I will, here's, here's cessationists, you know, and continuationists are going to agree. Chapter 12 through 14 is a continued 
theme. He's talking about spiritual gifts like kind of the whole time. And he does it to drive in. He talks about lots of stuff, but he but the whole theme of spiritual gifts is throughout the whole thing. So, um, you know, the love section is embedded in an overall larger section, 12 and 14, dealing with spiritual gifts. Um, so that that's why the context is there like it is. All right. Let me give you a couple different approaches to these verses. I'll leave them on the screen here for you. Um, let's see. Yeah, 8 through 12 is what you really need to see. And I'll put that up on your screen so you can kind of like embed this in your mind, be thinking about it while I'm telling you their interpretations. And I'll go to some other verses as well. So here's one interpretation. Is that the thing that's perfect, that which is perfect, and I'll highlight it here, when the perfect comes, that um, one cessationist view is that this perfect thing is the Bible. It's the scripture. And we agree that scripture is perfect, Right. It is, it is perfect, but is it this perfect thing is the question. And one way to support this idea is to go to James chapter 1, verse 23, and read on a bit into verse 25. Now, they're going to use this to support the idea that it's scripture being talked about. Remember, 1 Corinthians 13 talked about there being, we see now in a mirror dimly, and then when that which is perfect comes. Well, look at those two words, mirror and perfect. In fact, even in the Greek, the word perfect is teleos, and it's the same word used in this passage in James. Let me read it to you. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he, and so they're looking at the word, hearing the words, like looking in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he's like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer, but forgets, uh, who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Um, so th this is the idea that, hey, look, there's this connection that some people see between the that which is perfect and the, and the mirror and in 1 Corinthians 13 and in James chapter 1. So therefore, hey, um, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about when the Bible comes. So I would interpret the passage this way. I would say when that which is perfect, when the Bible is, is fully written, a process we, we call inscripturation, the, you know, the writing of scripture. When that's done, these gifts are gone. They're not needed anymore. And if, and if that which is perfect is the Bible, then that would be a correct interpretation for this passage. There's a couple things I'll say already against this uh, interpretation, because I don't want you to forget this later when we're going through the verses. So here's a few problems with this. Um, teleos, right? That is the same word for perfect, but it's used lots of times in James as well as in 1 Corinthians. And many times it doesn't, ref it doesn't refer to uh, anything like the Bible um, in that, even though the Bible's perfect, that's not what this context is, seems to be referring to. So in uh, James chapter 1, verse 4, it refers to us being perfect as the result of endurance in trials, meaning mature. We, we grow up. In verse 17, it talks, James 1, 17, it talks about perfect gifts. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. And so that's teleos as well, same same root word there. Um, the uh, There's another issue here. So perfect, by the way, perfect doesn't mean Scripture and and when we talk about um, the law of liberty, the law of liberty is that the Bible? Well, no. I mean, I think theologically that's not the Bible. Now, the Bible reveals to us what the law of liberty is, but the law of liberty is not the text of Scripture. And there's just a difference between between those two things. And so they were already aware of the law of liberty, even though the, the Scripture had was still being written when James wrote. They already knew the law of liberty because they were hearers of the word. Now, once it was written down, we have it written there, but it's not something that's um, dependent upon that. I, I hope that we can see there's a difference. There's a connection, but there's a difference between the, the Bible versus the law of liberty here. Then the next thing is the connection with mirror. Now, at first, it's impressive. James 1 says mirror and 1 Corinthians 13 says mirror. Um, but there's a problem. Uh, in James 1, the mirror thing is when I hear the word, the word's like a mirror. But in 1 Corinthians 13, he's looking forward to a time when we're not seeing through a mirror anymore. Think about it for a second. So if the completion of the text was, now we have a perfect mirror, if, if that's what was meant by James, which I don't think is the case, or 1 Corinthians. If that was what was meant, I'd have a perfect mirror. I wouldn't have no mirror at all. Instead, we'll see in 1 Corinthians, we want to see face to face, not through the mirror. Ah, so we're not, so here James's use of mirror and 1 Corinthians use of mirror, very different terms, very, or diff, different usages of the term. James, hey, you're, 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 you're seeing a reflection of yourself as you hear the word of God. It's exposing who you are. You better respond and be a doer. 1 Corinthians is like, hey, now we see dimly in a mirror. We're, we're, we're seeing 
partial knowledge, partial revelation. And there's a time when we'll see God face to face. That'll be my interpretation. I'll establish a little bit later. Okay, so let's look at the second. I think the first one, a lot of people will disagree with. And even even cessationists. Many cessationists don't actually use 1 Corinthians 13. And they'll say not to use it. They'll tell others, don't use it either. And I think that's good wisdom. Because that's not verse by verse like what you get from the passage. Um, so the, the hardest interpretation to support is the one that says that which is perfect is scripture itself. Although scripture is perfect, God's perfect, you know, lots of things. We can use the term for multiple things. <laughs> so um, we have to look at the context to establish the meaning of the term. Now there's another more complicated interpretation that I got from an article I linked in the video description. This article came from the Master's Seminary. That's like, you know, connected with John MacArthur. So I, it's a 37 page article. I'm not gonna even try to respond to everything in there, but most of it is just background information. It's actually, you gotta read quite a lot before you find out what the nitty gritty argument is um, for why 1 Corinthians 13, they, this author thinks supports cessationism. So I'm going to give you just kind of the nitty gritty summary of it. It involves a few key concepts. Here's a sort of complicated idea. First Corinthians 13, still on your screen, or it should be. Um, here's why they think this, this passage uh, speaks of cessationism, even though they're not interpreting that which is perfect to be the Bible. Okay, so there's three key concepts I'll explain that they build this interpretation on. The first one is this, that prophecy and knowledge are really not just referring to the act of prophesying or the act of coming having knowledge, but they're referring to the act of inscripturated revelation. That's a term you'll get in this article over and over again. Inscripturated revelation. When you say inscripturated, you mean you put it in writing. I put it into scripture. I, I, I wrote down the revelation. Meaning that this author thinks that 1 Corinthians 13's mention of prophecy and knowledge that that prophecy and knowledge was primarily not just for one time to minister to people, to, uh, you know, communicate God's, whatever God wanted to communicate to someone at the time, but rather it was those prophecies and, and, and knowledge moments of the spiritual gifts were meant to write down the Bible. Meaning that I would, I guess I would anticipate if I was in Corinth or one of these places like Antioch where prophets were at the time in the, in the first century, that I would have heard these prophecies that would have been just the same thing that I later would have read in Luke or Acts or Romans or Revelation. Uh, um, you know, I would have, although I think Revelation just came later. I don't think that was revealed earlier. But I, I would just hear sort of scripture because the purpose of prophecy and knowledge is inscripturated revelation. That's a major key. And I think it's probably the biggest flaw in this argument. You, I don't think you can substantiate that, but I'll come back to it in a minute. The second key concept is that a there's a massive time gap between verses 11 and 12. So here's verse 11. Um, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see these things. Um, actually, I should say verses 9 through 11, right? Or even 8 through 11. Basically, knowledge, prophecy, tongues, these are going to pass away. And there's this massive time gap before verse 12 happens where I, I see in a mirror and then I see face to face. Now I you know in part, but then I shall know fully. So that then fully knowing things, then seeing face to face, massive time gap, thousands of years, uh, certainly um, over a thousand years has happened um, in the interim, basically from the apostles till now. Big time gap. That's another key concept that he doesn't really spend a lot of time on in the article. You have to read a long time to find it, but that's a key concept. The third one is, the third one is this, that which is perfect, that, that phrase, um, I think I'm quoting the King James, New King James, because that's like what's in my brain here. But um, the perfect, when the perfect comes, that phrase there, it is not the Bible. It is the church brought to maturity. The church brought to maturity. When the church is brought to a state of perfection, which that word teleos can be translated as mature or fully grown. When the church is brought to that state of maturity, then prophecy and all that will pass away. And because that was a reference to writing scripture down, that's going to happen when scripture right, is written down. And then in the future, you know, hundreds, thousands of years, that's when I'll be face to face. So that that's this interpretation. Now, it's a 37 page article. It takes a while to get there, but that's the idea. Um, um, here's the here's the the click, the clincher for this third um, key concept in the Master Seminary article that I've linked in the video description. He says that which is perfect is not the Bible. It's the church being mature. But he measures the church being mature by having the Bible. Because the Bible is able to equip us that we might be full and complete for every good work or mature for every good work. 
So it's not actual maturity of the church. It's the potential maturity of the church achieved through the written word. So in other words, it's a roundabout way of saying that which is perfect is when the Bible is written. Um, it's a way of trying to get around, I think, the obvious exegetical problems of the first cessationist interpretation of this passage. So let's go through these a little bit more detail. And I hope, you're, I hope you guys are enjoying this. This is what we do. It's thinking biblically about everything, trying to analyze these things. I want to sh share with you thoughtful cessationist arguments and then give you some responses and then give you some balance. I hope you're enjoying it. And by the way, if you haven't got a Bible Thinker mug, they're available. There's a link in the description below. Um, and you can go uh, order one if you'd like to help support this ministry a little bit. I think I get like five bucks. <laughs> so, but it's, it's helpful a little bit. All right. Let's dig into sort of rebutting a little bit of the things and explaining them in more detail. Uh, I'm going to read to you, like I said, it's a complicated interpretation, but I want to give it its due credit because I think it represents what a lot of cessationists would hold to since especially it's from the master's seminary. So I think it's, it's a good one to go to. Here I am quoting from the article itself and I'll read it to you word for word. It says, he sets forth a conceptual statement concerning the cessation of these three revelatory gifts. That would be prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. In developing the, the thought of love's supremacy, his purpose is not to set a date. From a present perspective, the gap between the subjects in verses 8 through 11 and verse 12, and in verse 12, is many years. But that was not obvious to Paul. To him, the process of revelation was taking place, verse 8. And that there would be a time when the revelatory process would come to an end, verses 9 through 11, was a, was a conceptual truth. But he saw that even such revelation, no matter how great, could not begin to compare with the final and full revelation when seeing Christ face to face. So he acknowledges that verse 12 is about seeing Jesus face to face. But he tries to basically shove a thousand, over a thousand years of time in between these, pa these verses. And it, I, I think it doesn't work. Um, good effort. <laughs> a for effort. But I don't think it works verse by verse, just exegetically letting the word of God speak. All right, let me tackle these things, these key principles. Here's the idea, right? The first one was that prophecy and knowledge are really inscripturated revelation. Let me read you a quote where he actually tries to support this from the article. This emphasizes the fact that inscripturated revelation represented here by the gifts of prophecy and knowledge would be forcefully brought to an end at some point future to the time of writing. Now, I was looking for a spot and I didn't find it. It's a big article. Maybe I missed it. Um, I was looking for some place where he actually defends the idea that prophecy and knowledge is all about inscripturated revelation, but it, he just assumes it. He just kind of says it. And I didn't find any place, forgive me if I, if I missed something, where because I wanted to tackle that. I don't see any place where, uh, where he actually does so, where he actually uh, establishes that this is about writing it down. It's always about writing it down. Um, and except to say that we're the foundation of the apostles and prophets, except that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Um, when you track these gifts throughout the text of scripture, they're not always related to that foundation. So tongues though, tongues is the third one in 1 Corinthians 13. And tongues is supposed to cease because it's related to the other two being completed. Tongues is seen as being done as a result of association with the completion of prophecy and knowledge, right? If you accept that this prophecy and knowledge are really about inscripturated revelation. Here's a couple of challenges I have. Um, First off, the Bible doesn't make it clear that they're about that. Second, the prophets of the New Testament generally didn't have anything they said brought into Scripture. Think about it. For the most part, whatever they said, we don't even know what they said. It wasn't written down. Um, Agabus is an exception, right? Agabus is one prophet in Acts who tells about a coming famine, and then they send money to help and help support the saints in Jerusalem as a result of this famine. Um, but he he's prophesying future events. We, we also read about... Um, prophets in Antioch, and we have no record of what, whatever they wrote or whatever they said. I mean, if, if they're all about inscripturation, then, then it sounds like we lost scripture, if, if that's your view. And I think that's a wrong view. Philip's daughters, they prophesied. He had four daughters who prophesied, but we have no idea what they prophesied about. We don't know what they said because it wasn't written down. So there's just no solid case for his, his, um, his first, like, um, key point that prophecy and knowledge are inscripturated revelation. There's no biblical case for that. They're related, but they're not the same thing. They're not so closely related that that his his point holds. I'll put it that way. 
Uh, number two, the second key, that there's a massive time gap between verses 11 and 12. Keep that in mind. We're going to do a verse-by-verse -verse study through this passage really briefly here. And you'll see that it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, the things in verse 12 are connected to the things in verse uh, 10 and 11 and 9 and 8. It, it's all connected. There's no massive time gap. It doesn't look like there's space for one there. Um, then the third point was that which is perfect is the church brought to maturity. But that's just by that he just means the Bible is done. In which case we have all the same problems we have with the first interpretation about associating it that which is perfect with the Bible being done. Um, he, it, it's just kind of a weird interpretation. Um, I think he's working way too hard, to be honest. And I forget the name of the guy that wrote the article. I'm not trying to dog, rip, rip on anybody. But the authority of Scripture and the clear teaching of the, of the Word is what's important here. So let's go through this passage and let's look at it carefully. And just do like a verse-by-verse -verse study. And I'm doing this, by the way, because I get this question a lot. I've had people ask me about 1 Corinthians 13 multiple times. And I just thought it'd be good to have it on a video. Um, so 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Okay, so what won't end is love. Okay, we get that. Love is not going to stop. Your, love is always the duty of a believer. For all eternity, our duty is love. This is kind of neat stuff, right? This is Christian theology. That love is at the center of, of our character and of our behavior and all that. It's amazing, beautiful stuff. This is Paul's main point. We don't want to miss this. Even though we're trying to talk about a debate within the church, we don't want to miss the main point, which is love. Which is that we be, be embracing and loving to one another in Christ. Uh, real love, not not worldly love, not approving everything everyone does, not supporting whatever they want to pursue. You do you, man. That's not love. Um, that's a type of cowardice in the face of sin, actually. Uh, but no, no, love, like biblical love, where I love God first and love others, even when they say I'm hating him for it. Anyways, um, there are three things that will stop, though, right? Prophecy, knowledge, and tongues. And by prophecies, I, I with the cessationist, I take this to talk about the activity of prophecy, like that was, which was going on in the Corinthian church gatherings. He's talking about the, act, the the gift of prophecy, that, that that ongoing gift of prophecy will not be needed anymore. That the ongoing gift of knowledge from God, divine knowledge from God, that will not be needed anymore. And, if, and you, for context, just read 12 through 14, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. You'll see this is about spiritual gifts. It's not about knowledge in general. Like knowledge will pass away. Like we'll all just be totally ignorant of everything in, in eternity. That's not the case. It's talking about the gift of knowledge like a, a speaking revelatory gift. I agree. And then tongues. Um, this is a slightly different Greek word used for tongues. It just says it's going to end um, instead of it being like passing away. It's just slightly different terminology that's there. I don't think we can get a whole lot out of the terms that are there. Um, people debate that, but I won't. Um, but basically tongues, there's a variety of uses of tongues in the New Testament with interpretation and without. But, but Paul here just says, hey, it's going to pass away. All three of these things are going to pass away. So it is talking about gifts, at least these three, if not others, ceasing. Now the question is, when will this happen? And that's when we get to verse 9 and 10 and 11. So he describes the, the situation, the when and the why these gifts will stop happening, when cessation will become a thing. Verse um, 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When the perfect comes, remember that here's three options I'll give for the perfect coming, right? The first one is, oh, it's when the Bible comes. Okay, but that doesn't seem to work. And you'll see why as we continue through the passage. Number two is the church becomes mature, which the article says is when the Bible's finished being written, which sounds a lot like the first one. And uh, number three, that the second coming or or, or our, our resurrected state before Christ when we are with Jesus, that that's when that which is perfect comes. So those are the three options. I'm going to take the third and I'll explain why as we go through. So here's the issue. We only know so much right now. Verse nine, we know in part, we prophesy in part. First thing I want you to highlight is this, the word we. Paul includes himself as those who know in part and as those who prophesy in part. It would seem to include all people, including the other apostles as well. Paul, when he's like, we, 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 uh, in 1 Corinthians, he's often referring to what what we preach to you and him. He includes Apollos, he includes Cephas and all that kind of thing. I think he's saying, all of us, all the knowledge we have, we only know so many things. We know in part, we prophesy in part. If inscripturation were in view, then you would think that the knowledge of the apostles was not in part because you're thinking when it gets fully written down, now we know in full. When it's written down, now I know in full. But 
even everything that they said written down is still only partial knowledge. It's true knowledge, it's divinely revealed knowledge, but it's still not complete knowledge of the kind he's talking about later on in this verse, in these in these verses. So why does Paul include himself in this? Um, that's that's the first challenge I'd have to the, the cessationist. Um, Paul would be like, you know in part, um, once we give you all the information we have, then you'll fully know. That would be the cessationist, the consistent, I think, cessationist view where they don't have to create a thousand year time gap between two verses here. Um, even prophecy is limited in part in this passage. Even prophecy is limited. He says we prophesy in part. Like even, even our prophecies are just partial. If inscripturation was in view, then you'd think the accumulation of information from the apostles and prophets would result in knowing fully and prophesying completely. It would be the completion of those things. But he's saying, no, no, this is all temporary. It's all sort of like, here's what you know for now. Wait on the rest at the coming of Christ. That's, that's the idea. And um, that's good wisdom for us to recognize there's a lot we don't know. And there's a lot we're waiting on our Lord for. The, this just rules out the idea already um, that this is when inscripturation takes place or when the church is being made mature by inscripturation taking place, by the Bible being written, because it's just not how it would be written if that was the point. Um, so knowledge and prophecy as gifts will not result in knowing fully. That's what I get from this. Knowledge and prophecy as gifts don't result in us knowing fully. So whatever is that which is perfect is not going to be the result of knowledge and prophecy being inscripturated. That would be, um, that would be the point, which rules out the, the both interpretations I saw from the cessationist viewpoint. Verse eleven, he goes on more. He says, "When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways." This is just a simple analogy. Uh, these gifts are temporary; they're a measure that is to be set aside when we reach this state of maturity. And here's where I would agree with. It seems like I'd agree with that second view, right? Um, but the the second view, the problem with it is it equates the maturity of the church of Christians with inscripturation instead of what First Corinthians 15 we'll talk about, we'll read later, which is our glorification. When this, you know, this mortal must put on immortality, that that's the thing it's talking about, I believe. Um, that's our full final maturity. Um, verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly. Now we see in a mirror dimly. Now there's a now and then descripted here, described here. Let's keep these in mind. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So let's compare the now and then. The now is I'm seeing in a mirror dimly. Now I'm knowing in part. This is to say that my pro the prophecy and knowledge, these things and tongues, this is all a result of these mirror dimly and knowing in part. But there's a future time when I will be face to face, not in a mirror dimly, face to face. And this, it seems, is talking about being with God face-to-face -face with God, face-to-face -face with Christ. And the now and the then connect it to the previous verses. Verse 12 here doesn't, doesn't give us a huge time gap, right? When that which is perfect comes, when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. There's a when and there's a now and a then here in verse 10. Well, there it is in verse 12 described. Let's, let's fill out our understanding of the now and the then. It's obviously when I'll be with God. I can find support for this uh, in 1 John 3, 2. Notice he said, then I will know fully even as I have been fully known. Well, 1 John 3, 2, beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We're going to be like him relationally and this is going to enable us to see him as he is. I mean, imagine... Seeing Jesus as he is in his full glory and in, in, in all, all of his majesty. I, I, I was wondering the other day, because teach, I'm teaching through Mark, and, I'm, and I come across this passage where demons see Jesus and they, tr they tremble. You know, and they're fearful. Have you come to destroy us? And I was just thinking, like, what did they see when they saw Jesus? I mean, certainly more than what I see, right? Or what I would have seen if I had been there. But there's this time in the future coming where I will see the full revelation of the glory and majesty of God. And that's related to a relational thing. I will know as I am known. I will see him as he is because I will be changed. I'll be transformed. Um, and this connects to 1 Corinthians 8, 3. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. What, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, I will know even as I'm known. Well, here, earlier in the same book, he'd said that he is known by God. 
So he already mentioned that God knows him, this deep knowledge that God has of him. And he's talking about how he will have deep knowledge of God. Unlike now. Unlike now, while he knows partly, knows limited amounts of information. Um, so again, Paul includes himself in this. Paul had prophecy, tongues, knowledge, and he had revelation of the gospel from Jesus Christ himself, but he looked forward to greater things when the perfect had come and he would know all this stuff. Um, the Corinthians, they wouldn't have thought this was reference to when scripture would be finished, would be you know fully delivered to them. Um, I mean, I exalt the word of God. I'm just saying you, you, don't just, you don't just stick it into passages that aren't talking about it. In 1 Corinthians 15, I think it gives us more information. Remember, this is not far off. 1 Corinthians 15, we were in 13. Here we go to 15. And he says, I tell you this, brothers. And here's where he's talking, I think, about what is coming. The future thing that they're looking forward to. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. And so this is the thing when I think that which the perfect comes. It's not, it's the perfect comes. It's not like a an individual, uh, you know, becomes more mature. It's it's rather the whole state of perfection has arrived. And that's, I think, what he's speaking about here. And so finally, um, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, it, as we conclude, and I'll go, go to your guys' questions in just a couple minutes here. He just concludes by saying, hey, so now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. And so the emphasis is for us to walk in forgiveness, humility, gentleness, um, Correcting others for the sake of restoring them, encouraging them, being Christians who live out biblical godly love should be a bigger priority to us than these spiritual gifts, prophecy, tongues, any of that kind of stuff. Okay, now here's the thing. I do this video and I think, I think here's the problem. I'm going to do this video and um, like, okay, here, how do I explain? There are cessationists who have a view of People like myself, who I believe that the gifts are valid for today, um, that just think we're all like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And then there are continuationists who have a view of cessationists, like they're all just like these like bitter, like not open to the work of the Holy Spirit. or And, and both of these are wrong. Both of these are wrong. So I just kind of like refuted all this cessationist stuff. But I want to point out something. I want to point out that um, I agree I agree with cessationists, at least for my for my own opinion here. We do not have modern day apostles in the sense that the 12 apostles and Paul were apostles of Christ. We don't have that. Um, it, it just isn't a thing right now. Um, the best, the closest thing, I think if someone says they're an apostle, the closest thing for that is they're sent out by the church. They're like apostles of the church in this. Basically, they're missionaries. I'm not looking at it as anything like what a lot of people are thinking nowadays. Usually when I drive by churches and I see apostles on the signs, I I, uh, I wonder how that office actually functions in, in, in a real way in that fellowship um, because I just think of it as like a missionary. That's my opinion. I also agree that massive healings tended to specifically follow the apostles in the New Testament and perhaps only at times. Uh, they didn't always heal. And they seem to heal as they head out, headed out to new places to preach the gospel to new people. And then later on down the road, there seemed to be uh, some measure of less healing. Uh, we have multiple examples of this in the scripture. I'll do a video on it one of these days. Um, so I agree with you guys on that. Um, and perhaps this implies that there is less of the gifts of the spirit active in a normative sense than a lot of people who are continuationists are expecting. My view is this. I would take the word normative out of continuationism. I think I think I would, at least, and I'm open to changing my opinion on this, but I would say rather than expecting... I expect every service. I want to see prophecy. I want to see, you know, words of knowledge. And I want to see words of wisdom. And I want to see, I just, I just say, Lord, I want to see whatever you want to give us. And if that is this or, or not this, I'm fine with that. And if I go for a hundred years without seeing it, then that's fine. And if I have this flood of the Holy Spirit working in our fellowship, as long as it's the Holy Spirit doing it, then I'm totally down. Um, because I think the, that he gives gifts as he wills, according to his will. And it's not this content, con, continual constant stream of, cookie cutter behaviors throughout even the book of Acts, throughout what we see in the epistles or what we see in the church in our actual experience in real life. I also agree there's a lot of fakes. 
Um, and I want to point out a couple real quick because I want to separate the idea of being open to the work of the spirit, prophecy, word of knowledge, even tongues. I want to separate that from a couple other things. Let me share with you guys some stuff I saw um, earlier today on Facebook, unfortunately. This came from, um, not, and just someone's going to quote Matthew 18. This is not about Matthew 18. They didn't sin against me. They have public bad teaching and I'm calling it out publicly. That has nothing to do with Matthew 18. Just want to put that out there. Um, Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry is, um, I haven't done a lot on their school, actually. I did a video on Bethel that was helpful to a lot of people. And um, and I always wonder if I shouldn't have been more harsh in that video, to be honest. But their, their School of Supernatural Ministry is now pl planting other schools of supernatural ministry in other places. And this was something they put up earlier today. Maybe they've recanted it. It's disappeared off their page for whatever reason. But they suggest prophetic uno. Prophetic Uno, that you get your students in your school of supernatural ministry. This, I would call them kind of a hyper charismatic group. And you do Prophetic Uno. And here's the descriptions. I'll read it to you if you can't see that small print. Activation, Prophetic Uno. They always like to use the word activation. It refers to like, uh, you know, grabbing, getting your spiritual gifts like, like stirred up so you can, you can engage in them. They say, grab some Uno cards, a few of each color, and place them in the middle of the group. Have your students take turns going around the circle turning over the next card. Follow the instructions below as to what to do with that particular color card. This exercise is best with groups of six to eight students. Color instructions. If you draw a red card, then you give a prophetic word to the person on your left about their financial situation. If you draw a green card, you give a prophetic word to the person on your right about the relationship with someone close to them. Blue, you give a prophetic word to the, per the opposite, the person opposite you know, across the aisle from you, so to speak, about something that concerns them. Yellow, you choose what, who to give a prophetic word to in the group about their career, employment, or job. And it goes on. They have, you know, draw two, they have draw four, wild card instructions, it's all there. Let me give you another example. This is not what 1 Corinthians is talking about. <laughs> this is definitely not it. Um, this is uh, the person in the picture here, the, the lady in the picture here, who I have no animosity towards, um, or at least I hope I don't, um, is Teresa Dedman. And let me read to you who she is. Um, she says, I have been the creative arts director at Bethel Church and the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry in Redding, California since 2003, in which I equip, empower, and activate others. Uh, she has a website where she sells her art and she sells her designs, but I want you to see, I don't care that she's selling her art. Great. Sell your art. Cool. She's got nice art. That's fine. But look at what she claims about her art. And there's the website link. You can check it out for yourself. Um, these two claims are taken from different pages, but on the both on the same site. She says, I invite you to receive a spiritual impartation of the imprint of heaven. Receive a spiritual impartation of the imprint of heaven as you place one of the art pieces in a prominent area of your home or office, or as you sip a cup of tea or coffee. You know what? You guys can get this Bible thinker mug. It's not going to help you spiritually. <laughs> I just want you to know. <laughs> it's just going to help you drink coffee. <laughs> That's all it's going to do. It's just going to be art on your wall, but she's promising spiritual empowerment to people. But it, it gets, there's more. I hate to have to share this. This has been up for a while. This is nothing new. She's not changing her website anytime soon, I imagine. She also makes fashion designs, clothing designs. And Teresa says, my fashion designs embody the prophetic art they are created from. So she creates them prophetically, whatever that means. Wearing my art enhances your awareness of God's presence and helps you become a walking encounter of heaven's message to those around you. And the best-selling piece of prophetic clothing that she has are her angels surround you leggings, which I've just put on the screen for you. Forty-four ninety-five. This grieves my heart. This is not, this isn't prophecy. This isn't a gift of anything. This is a result of the social engineering that's gone on at Bethel and has gone on at other places where they encourage people to fake prophesy, to make up words of knowledge, to just literally fabricate stuff and trust that God is somehow just going to meet you there and make it work. That is not biblical. That is off the rails. And I want to just encourage, you know, hey, yeah, there are there are Christians who believe in the gifts of the Spirit who don't buy into this stuff. And nobody should buy into this stuff. Um, 
yeah, just huge amounts of social engineering rather than the work of the Holy Spirit is what I see going on in these types of circles. And it, and and I'm, I'm 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 bringing it up because they're just planting more and more schools all over the place, and they're reaching out to uh, to kids that I've discipled and you've discipled, and um, and they're bringing them into all kinds of um, frivolous, potentially dangerous teachings covered just lathered lathered in gospel and love you know terminologies just lathered and covered in kindness and and big picture christianity which i happen to love the idea of the big picture of christianity but it's the details about the gifts that get all wacky and weird um but here's the thing is i don't think the cure for this is cessationism i think the cure for this is the scripture already gives protections and limits to how the gifts of the spirit are to function in the church the Bible already tells us this. Those are our protections. It's easy to react reactionary. I'll be a cessationist. Hey, man, it'd be easier to be a cessationist after looking at some of the stuff you see. But I've also had times even in my own life where I believe God showed me things. And God gave me a prophetic word. And, it's, and I mean, it's like I can count on one hand the number of times. And those things then came true. Now, am I saying therefore it's true? No, but I am saying that that I won't. I won't say I can argue from experience that it's that those things don't exist or don't happen. But when uh, when people try to make them so normative, they have to come up with ways of making them normative. And those ways are ways of faking, I think, frequently. So those are those are my thoughts. And I hope uh, it's helpful to you guys. We're going to go to your guys' questions. Um, I dropped my phone. But uh, I'm going to go to your guys' questions right now and try to answer as many of them as I can in uh, in the time we've got left. Also, I want to mention, um, I just recently partnered with Logos Bible Software. Um, they're not paying me or something, but but I partner with them and I, I have like a partner portal. Basically, there's a link in the description. Some of you guys, you wonder like what Bible software I use. This is Logos Bible Software that I have on your screen here. Um, I find it to be a really fruitful, helpful software. I wouldn't recommend it unless I thought it was really good. I've been using it for like 13 years. So um, I do recommend it. But it is expensive, but there's different packages. And the reason why I'm saying all this is because I've partnered with them. I will, yeah, I will get a, like a small commission of some kind uh, when you, if you purchase a package, but you'll also get a 10% discount. And so you can use that link to actually save yourself money, which is, I think that's a win-win. Um, and it helps me continue to do this ministry because I'm, I'm now officially not being supported by my, uh, my fellowship, at least not in any significant, well, I should say not like I was before. <laughs> They're trying to help me out here, you know, where, where they can, but, um, but really you are, and you guys are making it happen and God's, God's blessing it. And it looks like this ministry is just going to continue. And I get to keep doing videos like this, making, helping people think biblically. Um, so yeah, if you want to support the ministry, there's a link in the description below as well. If you, if it's on your heart, don't feel any pressure to do so. Um, seriously, I really mean that. Uh, I just want, uh, I just need a small minority of people out there to say, I want to support this ministry and then we can make it work because my overhead's very low. I don't have a big building and all this staff and everything. It's just me. So uh, Caleb Broussard has a question. He says, tongues in 1 Corinthians 14, is Paul talking about specific languages or the common use of tongues we hear in churches today? Um, okay, I, I could be wrong here. I'll, I'll, I'll admit this, Caleb, but my opinion is that he's talking about languages and uh, actual languages. Um and I think that that's just what tongues means. I mean, if it's not a language, it's not really tongues. If it's not communication, it's not actually tongues. So I think that it's always a language if it's legitimately tongues. Um, that would be my impression. I also think people can just groan in the whole, groan to the spirit, like the spirit intercedes. Romans chapter eight with groanings, which words cannot express. I think that's a legitimate thing. I think you're just you you just emote to the Lord. You just oh gosh, you know you're crying out to God. He hears your whole heart. And I think that that's totally legitimate. I don't think that that's even a spiritual gift that you need imparted to you. But tongues is more of a of a gifting, and in my opinion, and I do think it's talking about actual tongues. I do wonder when Paul talks in First Corinthians fourteen about tongues of uh, and thirteen about tongues of men and angels, if in fact um, there is those who are speaking without interpretation because it's not even an English or a human language. Uh, maybe it is. I mean, angels must communicate somehow. Um, but again, I'm going really into speculation when I say that, so I must admit. Um, Judah Matthews, uh, advice on how to help um, pastoral and theological. A friend who's questioning a lot of traditional beliefs, a la Greg Boyd. I know exactly what you mean, Judah. Uh, he feels like he has to ask those questions. How do I walk with him through it? Uh, book, resource, 
oh, oh gosh, resources. That's a good question. Um, I, I don't off the top of my head know a good resource that specifically targets the kind of things that Greg Boyd is mentioning. Um, let me think. Um, I mean, Stand to Reason has some great resources. Got Questions has great resources online. Um, uh, Carm.org, like these are all fantastic people to go to and very conservative in, the, in, the, in a good sense, Christian views, like holding true to core Christian principles. I'm not talking about politics. Um, so I recommend some of those things, Judah, to you, but I'd also suggest that um, you get your friend to itemize his issues. <laughs> Um, itemize your issues. Just, just a suggestion. It may or may not help, but when you itemize the issue, instead of saying, oh, I have a problem with, with this over here with, oh, violence in, in the old Testament. And, and how do we know the Bible hasn't been changed? And like, is that really prophecy really true? Is that accurate? Um, um, I heard this disturbing thing online the other day and I saw this atheist video and it's just, you're not actually thinking about anything at that point. You're just feeling about everything and that can be dangerous. So I recommend write down very specifically what are your chief concerns? Like ask your friend, what are your top two issues? Top two, maybe top three issues. That's it. Be specific, not general issues, specific issues. And then with him, help do the research, walk him through, get lunch and deal with that. Reach out to other people for help and support um, and look online. Um, there will be some things I would encourage. Um, yeah, just some things. And for those who feel like they find they they feel like it's challenging in our in our modern world to hold to conservative christian values it can be really comforting to find a wacky theologian who's telling you that those conservative christian values are just wrong anyways um beware the comfort that that gives you because it may be a false catharsis <laughs> that you're actually going after and uh, often those teachers what they do is they spend half their time demonizing biblical christianity in order to, to to wedge in their own perspective and to make it make make biblical views so unappealing that you're willing to take their really far out reinterpretations of the scripture, and I do see some of that with some of these guys. Um, okay, so Arturo Mina says uh, cessationism, as far as I know, is usually associated with reformed systematic theology. They appeal to dispensationalism. Your thoughts on this? It seems to me that this div uh, this division these divisions are not accurate. Um, okay, dispensationalism, I don't really have a whole lot to comment on that. That's something one day I want to really d delve into more deeply. Um, covenant theology, dispensation, dispensationalism, and all that. Some elements of it I would agree with, uh, but others I, I think I would strongly disagree with. But anyways, what I will say is this, there are, there, yeah, yeah, more reformed people are cessationists, um, but uh, not all reformed people. And you have people like John Piper, you know, um, others, others who are not cessationists. Um, Paul Washer. I mean, you don't get any more reformed than that. <laughs> and he's not a cessationist, as far as I know. He's a cessation-ish. <laughs> he sees them as happening less, but not not being, uh, not a, not a ceasing. I, th I, that's my I, forgive me. That's my interpretation of Paul. I've seen a little bit of his teaching on the topic. I could have got him wrong there. That was my impression. Um, and I wouldn't even be opposed to that. I'd be like, yeah, the Lord can do it less or more as 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 he wants because I, I don't push that word normative too much. Um, okay, we have another question from uh, Hawks. Hawks J. Hawks. Um, uh, what role do gifts play? Do the gifts play at your church? Um, at our church, we don't, we don't generally see, that, for better or worse, we don't generally see like any emphasis in the gifts in our general typical gatherings during service times. What we do see is we're open to someone having, and very open to someone having a, a, a word from the Lord, right? That they might share, but not, they don't run up to the stage. They don't interrupt the service or something. They just share it with someone. They've got something to say. Um, we're very open to that. I'm very open to that. I've had people come to me. I'm like, I, I think the Lord told me something to tell you. I'm always, okay, share it with me. I'm, I'm going to listen, you know, and I'm going to consider it. And I'm going to weigh it. I'm going to think about it. Um, so we're open to those things. Um, and that's, and that's pretty much it. We don't, we don't have services around the gifts. Typically, we just are open to it in our, in our life, in our daily, everything we do kind of life. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't really think of us as anything kind of hyper charismatic in our particular church. Um, um, also, uh, Hawks J Hawks has a question. Would you agree that the people's, that people's views on this issue are based more on ex experience than scripture? I mean, sometimes, sometimes they are, 
Sometimes they are. And that's the tough thing is to try to just do it exegetically. That's the deal. Is I, I can't see any biblical reason to be a cessationist. I, I've heard the arguments. I've heard that basically trajectory arguments. It's implied. The trajectory of the Bible sort of implies cessationism. And I think that's not a, nearly a strong enough argument um, given all of the scripture that encourages us in the, the use of and conduct of the gifts in the church. Um, yeah. So from uh, Joshua Barger, hey Mike, I love your ministry. My question to you is this. Oh, thank you, Joshua. Uh, should Bible believing Christians be concerned about things like global warming? P.S. Just bought a Bible Thinker mug today. Oh, awesome. Cheers. Cheers to you, my friend. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, by the way, the Bible Thinker mugs, they get shipped in. in uh, batches and he ships them like every once in a while I'm, I don't know exactly when but you can always send him an email and ask him when the next shipment is coming in in case you're thinking it'll come in a day or two it probably is going to be a little longer um, so should we be concerned about things like global warming um, we should be concerned um, about everything um, I should be concerned about the state of politics I should be concerned about the state of the environment I should be concerned about all of that stuff that has nothing to do with whether or not the claims of certain advocates or certain people who are going against it, whether those claims are true or not, that's something you should definitely be worried about. We are in a environment where it's like charged, like you're picking a side when you say what you think about global warming. I mean, you're not even just saying what you think about global warming. You're picking a side when you say it. And so um, I have my soft opinions about it, but I haven't researched it that much because it's not something that um, that I focus on. But we should be concerned about everything. But our chief concern should be the gospel of Christ. If 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 these issues like global warming and environmental things take over our concern about the gospel, um, something is seriously wrong. We're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and his kingdom is not of this world, which means that guy getting saved is a bigger deal than the other issues. Um, Josh Sawyer has a question. What visible evidence do you have for the gifts of healing uh, and miracles being active today. Are there specific people who who have them that I can look at? Thanks, Mike. Uh, love your videos. Um, Josh Sawyer, probably for healing and miracles, probably the best resource we have recently out here. You can kind of see it off in the corner. It's a it's a two-volume series called Miracles. Um, and this is uh, by Craig Keener. Craig Keener, is, he's like a legit respected scholar, and he did uh, really in-depth work to try to catalog miracles that were done that reinforce the Christian worldview and that um, that have, uh, you know, testimony or x-rays or medical evidence, that kind of thing. It's that big two volume series. He also deals with all kinds of other stuff in there as well. So that would be what I would recommend as far as people who have like a gift of healing, like going around this person, this particular person's healing all kinds of people. I don't know anybody like that. I'm not sure that that's how that gift functions. In the text, it's called gifts of healings. And not, you know, we have gift of prophecy, but then we have gifts of healings, which just seems to make it slightly different. Um, and per so perhaps it's not a person. It's it's the gift uh, that happens, you know, each time. Um, so Practical Faith says, do you think that you can speak in tongues without having the gift of tongues? Too many questions already, moderators? <laughs> yeah, we do have a lot of questions. Um so can we speak in tongues without having the gift of tongues? I here, Here's my best stab at this question. Is that there perhaps are some people, perhaps, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe every single person has the gift of tongues. I don't think so, but maybe I'm wrong and that's the case. But my opinion is they don't. And I don't think scripture says they do personally. Um, so let's say that someone, they, they're speaking and what they're actually speaking is gibberish. It's not tongues at all. And then you're like, well, they don't have the gift, but they're just da -da 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 -da. they're just talking gibberish. And and you're going, is there something spiritual happening right now? And here's where I say, well, Romans 8, and I have a video on this, Romans 8, where the Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings which words cannot express. And I say, well, it is, it, maybe it is gibberish, but maybe it's gibberish where their heart is simply pouring out to the Lord. And so it's a, it's a confused believer who's truly pouring their heart out to God. That, that would be my own interpretation of that um, for what it's worth. Um, Piano Lab says, um, which known pastor inspired you the most? That's an interesting question. Which known? There's been a lot of pastors who have inspired me, and it's like they inspire me in pieces. Um, I don't have one that's inspired me the most. The people who've inspired me the most aren't pastors who I know like this through online ministry. 
the people who inspire me the most are people I know one-on-one -on -one personally. And they're people like, um, I've said this before, but like my father-in-law, um, he is, he's just such a great man, uh, loves the Lord. Um, so faithful, so patient, so loving, so diligent, walks in wisdom, fruit of the spirit. That guy inspires me more than most pastors <laughs> do. Not that they're not doing those things, but obviously I know him in a different way, you know, um, my own, senior, my own senior pastor has inspired me through his um, his diligence, his refusing to quit and keep in, continuing serving the Lord through all, all manner of hardship and difficulty uh, and pain. And um, so I, I, I get inspiration through lots of people. It's the people who you don't know that inspire me the most, though. Uh, sorry. Um, let's see. Here's the last question for tonight. It seems that modern usage of the sign gifts stems from the Azusa Street Revival in the early 1900s. Is there evidence that they were used before then and after the early church? Um, yeah, so this is an interesting debate. I did look into this because I wasted, spent too much time studying this topic. I sh I'm supposed to be doing other things right now for other stuff I've coming up. But um, but in the early church, some will tell you that that the early church um, patriarchs, the, basically the first 500 years of the church, that these guys were all cessationists. But when you actually look it up in more detail, they weren't. That's not the case. Like Augustine is one of the chief examples. But after seeing several examples of miracles and the work of the, of the Spirit, he changed his position. So you'll have quotes from Augustine from early life versus late life, and he has a different position on the topic. Um, so there are actually several people, like Justin Martyr, who talks about uh, prophecy and stuff happening during his time still. And, um, and that was second century. So, um, yeah, you can look that up on your own. Uh, just make sure to, if you hear someone saying they were all cessationists, you're, you're, you're getting a skewed result. That's just not the facts. So there, there's more information there in the early church that you can look at. Um, I would recommend you check it out. I, as far as it being a result of the Azusa street revival in the early 1900s, I, I couldn't tell you, perhaps it is, uh, per, perhaps some of it is, um, certainly, like for instance, Bethel, um, since I brought them up, um, Bill Johnson says that one of his things is he reads all these books of these revivalists, which which he takes to be these kinds of people. And some of them are kind of heretical in ways, but he reads all their books and tries to learn their methods and then apply them and try to refine them. And that's why they have like an engineered sort of approach to creating an environment of miracles, um, which I would say, you, as you know, if you've seen my Bethel video, um, I think is are not generally real miraculous things it's it's teaching people how to fake things i think which is exciting if they think it's real it's very exciting very encouraging very inspiring but uh, we need truth so that's going to be all for today thank you guys so much for joining me um we'll pick up um next monday the next mark series is going to come out in the gospel of mark i'm teaching through and then uh, next tuesday i think i'll be teaching some stuff um on potentially on penal substitutionary atonement and so I'm looking forward to that uh, because I'm doing an interview on that on um, on a podcast coming up here in a couple of days. So Lord bless you guys. Thank you so much for being with me and spending your time and energy to try to help just learn how to think biblically about everything. If this blesses you, maybe you could, you know, share the video, give it a like, that kind of thing. It just helps get the content out to more people. And I hope that this has been enlightening. Take care.